know why I don't go to Lodo on a Saturday night? It's craziness. Also, I'm a 35-year-old married man with a child at home. That is also why I don't go to Lodo on Saturday nights. But if I was single and ready to mingle, the kind of mingling that went down in the overnight hours this weekend was out of control. Crowds, fights, police shooting pepper balls, then a, a car speeds into several people. It was a wild scene we wouldn't have seen or even heard about it if not for witness video. Here's Steve Sager. This video is so intense that even Facebook warns you before you watch it. It begins with police firing what appear to be pepper balls into the crowd, a crowd where police say a fight had broken out. Let's stop it right here. You're about to see a car speed away and hit two people. And the only reason we feel comfortable showing it to you is because police told us neither of these people was seriously injured. <laughs> All of this happened around 2 a.m. Certainly I can I can recognize that it was a very dramatic video, uh, very concerning uh, to us and I can imagine to the public as well. As concerning as it may have been to police, they didn't mention the situation for 18 hours, not until a reporter tweeted at them asking about the video that was going viral. It did not rise to the criteria of our notification. There was not significant injury. There's certainly not a death. Um, there were no road closures as a result of that, and, and we really did not feel as though there was any continuing community concern uh, involved in that particular incident. Earlier this month, DPD cut off public access to its police radios, encrypting them. At the time, the chief said his department is committed to transparency. Transparency, apparently with a certain criteria, they say they established when the scanners went dark. Today, DPD told us the only time they feel you need to know something is if the injuries are serious enough, if it might impact your commute, and if there's any danger to the community. And they say a hit and run driver on the loose is not a danger to the community. It seems to be um, tied specifically to that particular event. So I would not say that uh, that, that suspect would be a, a danger to the community at large. For next, I'm Steve Steger. Denver police also stressed when they blocked public access to police scanners that the audio recordings would still be available through open records requests. So Steve filed one today, got denied. They said it was an ongoing investigation. We've seen you saying on social media that Denver might improve safety in Lodo by shutting down the streets when the bars let out, you know, when all the drunk, angry people stumble out looking for trouble. Austin does that in its 6th Street Entertainment District. Streets close Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays from 9 p.m. to 2.30 in the morning. Portland, Oregon does something similar in its entertainment area. It was the city council in each of those cities that made those decisions. DPD told us that they've recently started closing down Market Street north of 20th when the bars close. They're dealing with crowds there. Before they shut down more, like through Lodo, they want to run it by the mayor's office. As you know, we, we identify you know, problems and challenges in the Lodo area, you know, we may move our, our, our you know, traffic patterns uh, you know, to, to you know, change the way that the crowd uh, behaves. A final word on the Lodo melee over the weekend and Denver police only acknowledging it after the video went public. We cannot pretend like keeping the public in the dark is an unfortunate side effect of Mayor Hancock's administration blocking public access to police radio traffic. This is not a side effect of the system. This is the system. The scanners going private allows Denver police much more control over what the public knows and when. Pesky journalists and pesky citizens can't ask their pesky questions about incidents that they've never heard of. You have been put on a need-to-know basis. And when a driver plowed into people in a crowded part of downtown, and when police fired off pepper guns to keep a large crowd under control, Denver police decided you did not need to know. Perhaps this will inspire a whole new marketing slogan for our city. Denver, nothing to see here. In terms of a field sobriety test, what the Douglas County Sheriff's Office just did is the equivalent of trying to walk the straight line and falling in the ditch. They failed the test. Specifically, the Douglas County Sheriff's Office failed to keep 60 of its deputies certified to do field sobriety tests. The error means that those 60 deputies cannot perform sobriety tests, and they should not have been performing them in the one to three months since their certifications That's lapsed. Huge. Sheriff Tony Spurlock says they are currently reviewing whether any of those 60 deputies were performing sobriety tests without certification. Some of them may also have been new hires who were never certified. Now, obviously, all this could impact ongoing court cases. 
And what it also means is that instead of getting a two hour refresher on how to do a sobriety test, all those deputies would have to start fresh on certification. They'd have to go through 24 hours of training. An email from a Douglas County Patrol captain said that's, quote, going to dramatically impact an already overburdened division. Sheriff Tony Spurlock downplayed the issue. I want to say first I was shocked because I'm like going, boy, that, that just doesn't seem right. Um, and how could this happen? And then once we started looking at it, we determined that, well, it really wasn't what it says. Um, and then the training unit told me, they said, hey, we, we're, we've been putting the training together since May. Sheriff Spurlock says the deputies assigned to traffic enforcement and DUI patrols primarily, the ones who focus on that, they still have their certifications. And those deputies can be called to the scene to do a sobriety test if one of the 60 uncertified officers is the one who makes the stop. And the sheriff said they might just determine instead of 24 hours of new training, they just won't recertify those officers at all. When the newly progressive Denver City Council nuked the contracts for privately run halfway houses, it changed which communities will get future halfway house inmates. So right now, Denver City Council is considering a short term fix, but our Marshall Zellinger found out that fix could end up in your community. In which community will these people go, mm -hmm. right? They won't be coming into my community because there will be no contracts in my community that will be coming into yours. And into yours. Democratic State Representative Leslie Harrod lives in Denver, where halfway houses may cease to exist. Depending on what Denver City Council does tonight about the future of halfway houses run by private companies Geo and Core Civic. This impacts more than just the city of Denver. This impacts the entire state correctional system from one end to the other. If these Denver halfway houses close in six months or one year, prisons could stay full longer, since those inmates won't have an in-between facility to transition. If these Denver halfway houses close in six months or one year, inmates may be assigned to halfway houses in other metro area communities. If these Denver halfway houses close in six months or one year, will there be staff to make sure the inmates get the help they need, or worse yet, staff to make sure the inmates come back at the end of the night? How many of us would want to keep a job if we knew it was going to be gone in six months? Which one of us wouldn't be looking for something else knowing that you have to feed your family and your kids six months down the road? You're not going to do it just out of the goodness of your heart and stay somewhere. Are folks asking for, let me just be blunt, right? Are folks asking for more money from the state to deal with this issue? Yes, there has been a request. I don't know if it's gone through the former channels, but one of the comments to me was is that they, they wanted additional funds to pay staff, to encourage staff to stay on board for the next six months to a year. They wanted to have stipends to tell staff, if you stayed on to the end, we'll keep you on an additional month of pay. All right, well, I would hope that Core Civic and Geo would consider using their profit margins to pay their employees to keep them on board while this um, contract is being negotiated. The reason this was even being talked about at the Capitol is because that committee is supposed to figure out how to ease the prison population. This decision could really jam it up. Kyle, here are my takeaways from mm -hmm. the meeting uh, is that it, the opinion is that this Denver City Council should have talked to the state to say, hey, if we make this decision, what's the state impact and possibly talk to other communities about a decision that Denver's going to make. But I mean, if Denver wants to just go rogue and just do whatever it wants, whenever it wants, it can. Yeah, I have two thoughts on that. One is it's a home rule city. Mm -hmm. They control the house. Like if we want to cancel this, that's our prerogative. Or maybe this new city council didn't know that it was going to have that trickle up and trickle down effect. It's going to cost the state more money or it's going to cost other communities money because suddenly you're diverting Denver inmates to Arapahoe County, to Jefferson County, to Douglas County. It's, it's your issue now. Yeah, what a surprise. Action, reaction. Hmm. All right. Thank you, Marshall. Our next question comes from Allie, who says that she made a Twitter account just to talk to Next. We love you, Allie. She wondered, why does the city of Boulder's Ranger car have California plates? Seriously, a government vehicle with out-of-state plates. So I just kind of assumed that this was Governor Polis turning Colorado into Rata California, like those hilariously bad political ads. But no, a city of Boulder says they rent some vehicles when they need additional help with enforcement and maintenance. The city says that renting them based on need is a smarter choice and saves taxpayers money. So Cali plates on a Boulder truck aren't rata Californicating Colorado. It's actually fiscal conservatism. Hmm, who knew? Allie's question reminded us of the sharp-eyed Next viewer in 2016 who noticed that Denver's mobile restroom trailers had Montana plates. The city pays Liberty Waste Management for those vehicles, so they, they're not Denver's portable potties. We're just basically paying for them. That contract, by the way, runs through December of this year. 
Today, the trial began for Colorado's biggest 9-11 truther slash Palisade peach producer slash illegal marijuana grower. That last part is according to prosecutors. And it is the only reason that David Cox is on trial in Mesa County this week because growing peaches, not a crime. They're delicious. Also, it is not illegal to print up your peach boxes with 9-11 conspiracy theories that confuse people each summer when all they want to do is bite into a succulent piece of produce and instead come face to face with David Cox's theories about how 9-11 was an inside job. Cox went on trial today because along with the peaches, prosecutors contend he was illegally growing marijuana. He says that is retaliation for his 9-11 conspiracy views. He also insists that it was not marijuana, that it was legal hemp, which of course cannot get you high. We've seen a lot of cases like this over this confusion. So Cox is acting his, as his own attorney, which is the least surprising thing ever. He asked the judge today to delay the trial so that he could go get a real attorney. The judge said no, because he's asked for that again and again, and he never goes out and gets an attorney. So jury selection is next in the case of the Palisade peach grower, 9-11 conspiracy theorist, and grower of something. I didn't have a wall big enough in my house. So she put them in her garage, not where you would expect to find work from a famous artist. And on this Women's Equality Day, this state should take a bow. Colorado was so far ahead of the nation. A history lesson we can be proud of, next. Oh, what a day. Colorado, we see you. It looks like fall. It feels like fall, but it's still technically summer. As you know, the temperatures today some 20 degrees cooler than yesterday when we came close to a record, almost 100 yesterday, and we'll enjoy another day with temperatures below average. Very little moisture, even with this powerful system just knocking on our door to the north. We've got a wind shift that'll bring in a little bit of fog and maybe a few sprinkles or just a little bit of low cloud cover out in the far eastern plains tomorrow morning. Not quite into DIA. Don't think it'll impact travel there. Denver stays dry. We have a cool and comfortable evening coming up with forecast lows. Good sleeping weather in the mid 50s. Fair skies to kick off your Tuesday. Another nice day with temperatures about 10 degrees cooler than average. The heat returns midweek. Low 90s Thursday ahead of a week cool front taking us into a long weekend for many. Low to mid 90s for Sunday and the holiday on Monday. And uh, beautiful pictures coming in on the digital network tonight. Keep them coming. Let us know what you're up to. We want to know, right Kyle? Kit Carson, not the greatest dude, but that's a beautiful mountain. <laughs> hey, speaking of history, when American women won the right to vote in 1920, Colorado was like, 
Yeah, that's so 1893. On this Women's Equality Day, Byron Reed looks at the way that Colorado led the way. The road to women's equality has a long history here in Colorado, dating back to the 1890s. The first state to pass the right to vote before the rest of the nation got on board. So we were definitely a trailblazer in that arena. 27 years later, the 19th Amendment was signed into law, guaranteeing full voting rights to women across the country. Colorado preceded the nation by at least a quarter of a century um, in franchising women voters in 1893. Dawn DePrince is the chief operating officer for History Colorado and says before, women were often blocked from voting. Voting happened in saloons, and so um, that was one of the reasons that they did not want women to vote. They didn't want women to be entering into these traditionally male spaces. We are also here to celebrate. Today marks the 99th anniversary of the largest voting rights expansion in American history, which prohibits states and federal government from denying the right to vote based on gender. Women fought for this right. They organized, um, they went to every community and county in the state of Colorado, and they or organized voters around this very cause. So many people who have come here, um, not just to celebrate um, the rights we have as Americans, but also um, kind of the steps we've taken as Coloradans to make sure that we are all equal and free. Historic steps taken to help people from around the state. Women's Equality Day. <laughs> honor those who fought for women's right to vote. We honor them by carrying forward their legacy. For next, I'm Byron Reed. Colorado was also the first state with women elected into state government starting in 1895. And today, 47 of our state's 100 state legislators are women. The state still has never elected a woman as governor or U.S. Senator. So I gotta ask, if you had a painting by a famous artist, big deal, where would you display it? Sleeping in my garage, it's waiting for a home. Those paintings have a great backstory and now a new home.
Have you seen that movie Argo? Ben Affleck's in it. He plays a CIA agent who rescued Americans from Iran. Maybe you know this. The guy he portrayed, he's from Denver. And before that man worked for the CIA, he was an artist who did work in an old hotel that was demolished in Washington Park. Now, two of the paintings that used to be in that hotel have a new home. It's about being in an environment that is constantly bringing different thoughts into your mind and what better way to achieve that than by surrounding yourself with artwork. My name's Caroline Lofts and I'm the COO at Workability. Okay, so these are the two paintings that Tony uh, did. We have two pieces of art that were created by Tony Mendez, who is best known for his work in the CIA, for pulling off an audacious uh, escape uh, by pretending to be a film producer, most famously depicted by Ben Affleck in the film Argo. But before all of that, he was busy being a, a creative uh, soul in Denver. And these two paintings have been created using old photographs. Yeah, and they were in my garage for like 20 years. <laughs> Lisa uh, had found these paintings and was trying to find a good home for them. Uh, my name's Lisa Leiter. Back in 1968, they tore down um, the Park Lane Hotel in Denver, and these pictures were um, created up. He created these frescoes for the Park Lane Hotel. My dad was one of the guys that was there helping clean out the storage unit, and so they were, he, they were like, take those over and put them by the dumpster. And he's like, he really liked them, and he's like, well, could I take them? And they're like, yeah, sure, no problem. And then in 2000, he cleaned out his garage, and he's like, do you have a place for these? I really love them. And so they came to my garage. And then um, there was a story done. My father, Simon Lofts, is the person who saw the original piece on the local news. And Simon called me, and he's like, I would love to make a home for the pictures. And so that's how the pictures ended up here. I emailed and I just said, I have a couple of paintings, and I explained to him what the paintings were, and I sent him a photograph, not a very good photograph. And um, he said, I am the artist. He says, you know, I could get them from you, and I could bring them here to Maryland. He says, but I think that they have a provenance to be there in Denver, and it'd be really nice for them to be able to stay in Denver. The members of Workability are, in their own rights, creative, innovative people. And I think that uh, this is the perfect space for Tony's paintings to be, because it's like minds um, in all coming together. Tony Mendez passed away earlier this year. His son is a sculptor. He still lives in Denver. The most Colorado thing we saw today is people thinking right past fall, just skipping over fall and looking to hire something called a snow reporter. And you folks know a lot about the history of women's suffrage. You educated me with your emails during the commercial breaks and I'll share a few of them next.
The most Colorado thing we've seen today is thinking snow in summertime. Winter Park is trying to lock down snow reporters for ski season. Now, I, I'm just a regular reporter, but a snow reporter sounds like it'd be a, a cool title and a sweet job. You ski or snowboard, and then you report on the mountain and the snow conditions. Sounds like a pretty good gig. You share the most Colorado thing you've seen using the hashtag HeyNext or email us next at 9news.com. On women's suffrage and Colorado's role, and a number of you, Kathleen, Ken, Tom, Larry, all wrote in to note that Wyoming, while a territory, gave women the right to vote. They came into the union in 1890. And Joe writes in, I never heard this, that women could vote in New Jersey in the late 1790s before the right was taken away. A fact coming in from Joe Manley.